Hey, ever since I was a kid, I, I dreamed of finding hidden treasure. Um, I, I, would, I would dream, maybe, maybe it's because I grew up around the water in South Florida, but I would, I would dream about um, finding a sunken ship somewhere and finding in it a big treasure chest full of all kinds of gold coins. I would dream, daydream about you know, digging a hole somewhere and just coming on a container full of jewels and jewelry and, and being rich all of a sudden, finding him. Anybody relate to that? Anybody? Is it, am I the only weirdo here? Um, you know, I think that's why we like some of these adventure movies because, you know, there's a guy looking for treasure, you know, Indiana Jones or whatever. And, and you just kind of get this adventurous kind of thing going on when you talk about hidden treasure, you know. The, the reality is, it happens. It, it really happens, and I think that's kind of what keeps the dream alive in my head a little bit. And it's not so much becoming rich, it's just finding something like that would be kind of cool. But let me read you a couple of, of stories about people where that really happened. Um, this first one, this is an Associated Press article, and in, it, the, the title of it, Friends Find Buried Treasure in Backyard. It's the stuff of fantasies, and Tim Crabase found it buried under two feet of earth in his own backyard. There he and friend Barry Billcliffe found a box stuffed with cash and gold and silver certificates, some more than a century old. The buried treasure is worth up to $75,000, according to a coin shop owner that they consulted. Quote, I was thinking, I've never seen anything like this in my life, said Dominique Mangiano, owner of the Village Coin Shop in Playstown, New Hampshire. Crebase said the find came when he and Bill Cliff were trying to dig a small tree. Crebase heard a thud and saw that he had hit a piece of wood. Another look and he saw the wood was part of a two foot wide box. He ripped the top off and found Nine rusted cans that he and Bill Cliff cracked open to find 1,800 bills, including more than 900 $1 bills, 200 $2 bills, and 300 $20 bills dated from 1899 to 1829. There was also piles of gold and silver certificates and scores of notes from local banks. How would you like to find that in your backyard? Pretty cool, huh? Here's another one. An unknown artist's work left inside a small Long Island bungalow where he once lived has been valued at up to $30 million. The artwork was discovered by Tom Schultz in 2006 when he bought the cottage and, de um, and a detached garage uh, as an investment property for about $300,000. Schultz, a former deli owner and a father of three, had been instructed by the cottage's previous owners to throw all the works away. But as he looked over the collection of almost 7,000 paintings, drawings, and journals, he just couldn't get rid of them. Quote, it was just someone's life's work and it didn't belong in a dumpster, he said. The art was by an obscure Armenian American painter named Arthur, Arthur Panagian, a decorated World War II veteran and a former comic book illustrator. He lived with his sister until his death in 1999. Panagian's paintings have now been displayed and sold in galleries from New York to Los Angeles, and the art, once abandoned as trash, is being valued by some at between 25 to 35 million. Some pieces already have sold for 500,000. The guy bought the house for 300,000. <laughs> and he's got 30 million dollars worth of artwork. Amazing, isn't it? And I know, I know what you guys are gonna do when you go home. Huh? <laughs> hey babe. We get one shovel. <laughs> the, the reality is, you know, those things, they happen. I mean, I don't know what the odds are. It's like way out there somewhere. But it, it, reading this stuff, it reminds me of a lot of Christians, followers of Jesus, 
We, we have faith that Christ is our Savior and, and He died for us and we have salvation. And that's a tremendous blessing. But, but so many miss out on further blessing that God has for them right now. It, it's, like, it's like they miss out on hidden treasure right underneath their nose. And you go, well, wait a minute. Right? What are you talking about, hidden treasure? I'm talking about blessing that, that God has and he wants to give and he's ready and willing to give it, but he can't. You say, what do you mean he can't? He's God. If he wants to do it, he can do it. No, no, no. See, God is a loving Father, and He's only going to do what's best for us. And He knows until we're in a place where we can receive that blessing, He can't dump it out on us. You know what I'm talking about, because many of you have children. And you know that with your own children, there are times that you would love to bless them, but because their ornery little spirit is not lining up under your authority, you can't do it, or you're just going to create even more of a monster than you may have already got. You know what I'm saying? And as a heavenly father, God is saying, man, I'd love to, but I, I can't because you're not ready. Um, if you've ever been to a, an authentic pizzeria, nothing against Pizza Cafe. It's very good. <laughs> but I don't think that you would call it a pizzeria. Uh, an authentic pizzeria run by Italians, you know, it's, it's really quite an experience. And one of the things, I haven't gone a lot, but a few times that I've gone, one of the things I really love is, is the way they prepare the dough. Man, and that dough goes through it, man. They, they got to get that dough ready and they take that out and they throw it down on the counter. Bam! And they throw it again. Bam! And then they pick it up and they put it down there and they get a roller and they roll it all out, mash it all out flat. Then they pick it up and they throw it up in the air and they spin it. I mean, that dough goes through it. <laughs> and most people aren't all that concerned about what happens with the dough. They just want to get to the good stuff. They want to get to the pepperoni and the sausage and the sauce. That's all they're concerned about. But the reality is... Until the dough is ready to receive the good stuff, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be what it needs to be. See, that's how it is with a lot of people. Christians, we, we want the blessing, we want the good stuff, but God's trying to tell us, your dough ain't ready yet. You can't receive the good stuff yet because i got to work on that dough a little bit more. And you say, okay... If my dough isn't prepared, how do I get it prepared? And that's what I want to take the next few minutes and talk to you about. I want to give you three ideas this morning that will help you to be prepared to receive God's blessing in your life. So here we go. Here's number one. I don't know about you, but I want God's blessing in my life, right? Here's the first one. Blessing comes when you humbly rely on God's person. Blessing comes when you humbly rely on God's person. Listen to Psalm 40, verse 4. How blessed, oop, there's our word, how blessed is the man, or literally person, who has made the Lord his trust. Well, when you trust, you are relying on, this is another way of saying relying on, how blessed is the person who has made the Lord his trust or his reliance and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. What's he saying there? He's saying, look, the person who is blessed is the one who relies on God. Doesn't look for the person who is boastful and proud. It could be actually himself is the person who's boastful, proud. But it's not, not looking for someone who is manipulative in their words and they're false in what they say. They're going to rely on God. They're going to put their trust in God. That person, Scripture says, will be blessed. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. That's just another way of saying that a humble spirit will get blessed. That's what it's saying. You want blessing? Here's an idea for you. Rely on God's person. Humbly rely on God's person. We sang a song this morning. Lord, I need you. And I know some in here were singing that because you're going through something right now and you're going, Lord, I need you. Like right now, God. 
There's not enough money to pay the bills. Lord, I'm looking at a physical situation and I'm kind of scared. And Lord, I need you right now. Some of you sang that song this morning and it was from your heart. Because you, you want to tap into God right now. Right? And that's not bad. That's good. But here's the reality, folks. We need to do that kind of relying on God all the time. All the time. It needs to be before you get your head off the pillow in the morning. God, I need you today, Lord. I don't know what I'm going to face. I don't know who I'm going to face. All I know, Lord, is without you today, it ain't going to happen the way it needs to happen. I need you, Lord. And there needs to be a humble reliance on the person of God. Listen, and when that happens, guess what? You are setting yourself up for blessing. See, when we get all, you know, oh, I got it. I got it. No, there's certain things I need God on, but you know, that's maybe a small percentage of life, and the rest of it I get. You're setting yourself up to fall. That's a prideful attitude. That's an attitude. That, listen, listen. Here's the bottom line. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ in here this morning, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, the bottom line is you had to come to a point of humble reliance when you placed your faith in Jesus. Because what you had to say, and if you didn't say this, by the way, you're not really a follower of Christ. You had to in some way say, Jesus, I know I cannot take care of my own sin. Jesus, I know I cannot get to God except through you. That's what we talked about last week in that I am statement, right? He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So, what happens is I've got to come to a point in a time in my life where I have to totally rely on the fact that by, if it's up to me, I'm, I'm not getting there. I'm not getting to heaven. Can't do it. And so there has to come a time in your life when you humble yourself before God and say, God, I, I need you. I need you for salvation. I can't do it on my own. Now, if you've done that, praise God. If you haven't, man, you need to do it today before you leave here. Because you have no guarantee of what this week's going to bring forth. You have no idea if, you, if you're going to have a situation like Vernon did yesterday. I'm sure he didn't anticipate waking up yesterday morning and having an accident at the rodeo. And praise God it didn't kill him, but it could have. I'm sure Colette didn't wake up on Friday morning thinking, well, today's a great day to have a stroke. She didn't know. And praise God she's doing well, but it could have killed her. We all know those situations. If you're in here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, I've got to just ask you, what are you trusting in? Because you're trusting in something. You are relying on someone, either yourself or your church or something. But if it's not Jesus, he made a very clear statement. We, we talked about it in length last week. He said, I'm it. I'm the way, the truth, and life. If you don't come through me, you can't get to God. So what that means, folks, is this. There comes a time and a point in your life where you have to humbly rely on God for your salvation. And here's the bottom line. If, if that's good enough for your salvation, it's certainly good enough to run the rest of your life on. Rely on Him. In John chapter 9, just very quickly, we're going to look at a, a, a situation that Jesus had with a blind man. <clears throat> if you have your Bible this morning, John chapter 9, just the first five verses. If you don't have a Bible this morning, just listen real carefully. And it says, He, talking about Jesus, passed by. He saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? See, there was a common misconception in that day that if you had some kind of physical ailment, it's because either you had done a sin or your parents had done a sin, and so God was punishing you by making you blind or crippled or giving you a disease. And, and they really taught that and believed it. And so they see this guy born blind. They said, hey, Jesus, by the way, who sinned? Was it this guy that sinned or was it his parents? And Jesus answered them, verse 3, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. But it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. He goes, look, you guys got it all wrong. This guy didn't sin. His parents didn't sin. God has set this up so that you guys can see God's work come alive right in front of you. That's what he was saying. Then we go on to um, verse 6. When he had said this, he spat on the ground. He made clay of the spittle. He applied the clay to his eyes. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam which is translated sent. So he went away, and he washed, and he came back seeing. It's a great miracle. But can I tell you, there's a lot here that you miss right on the surface if you don't stop and think about it a little bit. We don't know 
much about this blind guy. We don't even know his name. We just know he was blind. We know that he couldn't see Jesus' miracles. We know that he never saw Jesus do a miracle because he was blind from birth, it says. So he never had an opportunity to see Jesus do some great miracle and go, wow, that's what I need. He might have heard about it. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But he still didn't actually see it. We know he didn't see it because he was blind. So all he knows is this guy's come up to him, spit in the dirt, taking that and put it on his eyes. And then he says, go, go to the pool of Siloam, which was, by the way, about three quarters of a mile from where he was. So he's a blind guy. He's got to walk through the crowd, get to this pool and wash off. Jesus didn't even say, and you'll be healed. You see it in the text? He didn't even say, and you'll see again. He just said, go and do it. You talk about humbly having to rely. Would you put this down under that bullet point? Rely on God even when you're not guaranteed a desired outcome. There's no guarantee here. Jesus never told him, look, do this and everything's going to be great. You're going to see again. Now that certainly was implied for sure. But there's no guarantee. Listen, when you rely on God, you've got to do it even though there's no guarantee. You don't wake up in the morning and God says, I just want you to know you are going to have a beautiful day. No problems today. Everything, okay God, then I'm going to rely on you. It doesn't work that way, does it? We just got to wake up and say, God, I'm relying on you. I don't know what's going to happen and I'm not even guaranteed that things won't happen. All I know is I need you today, Lord. Right? So, you want to be blessed? One of the ways to set yourself up for blessing is to humbly rely on the person of God. Here's number two. Blessing comes when you willingly submit to God's plan. You willingly submit to God's plan. Psalm 25, 12 says this. Who is the man or the person who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. This person that fears the Lord, and by the way, fearing the Lord means to take him seriously. God, I take you seriously. I know what you say you mean and what you do is for real. God, I take you seriously. Who is the person who takes God seriously? God will take that person and instruct him in the way. You know what that literally is saying? The way is his plan. It's God's plan. God will lay out his plan for him and look what will happen. Verse 13. His soul will abide in what? Prosperity. What is he saying? His soul will be blessed. You'll be a blessed person. Why? When you line up with God's plan. When you willingly submit to God's plan. See, here's the deal. On Sunday evenings, we've been talking about the family. We've been talking about the role of husbands and wives. Now we're talking about what, where children fit into the picture. And we've been calling it God's blueprint for the family. It's another way of saying God's plan for the family. God has a plan for your family. He has a plan for your relationship. And when you willingly line up under that, when you willingly submit to that, God has blessing waiting for you. But if the dough ain't ready... It ain't going to happen. You go, man, I just don't understand why God seems to bless that person. I don't ever get blessed. Check your life. <laughs> I, it's plain and simple. What, what are you doing? Maybe, maybe the best question is, what are you not doing? Right? Are you not willingly submitting to God's plan? It's like this. And, and, and I'm not, I'm certainly not a cowboy. I have ridden a horse once. <laughs> I was a small child. A small terrified child. Anyway, a, a, a wild horse, I mean I've watched it enough and, and talked to Barney enough to know that a, a wild horse, he wants his independence, right? Sharon, you correct me if I'm wrong here. Huh? He wants his independence. He, he, he doesn't want somebody on his back. Right? He wants the cowboy's food, and he wants the cowboy's water, and he wants the cowboy's barn when it's raining so he can come in out of the rain, but he don't want that cowboy on his back. 
You, you understand what I'm saying? But it takes, in order for that horse to fit into the plan that the cowboy has for him, to be a horse with purpose and function, that cowboy has to get on the back of that wild horse. And that horse will buck him and fight him because he doesn't want him on the back. You can almost hear him yelling, get off my back! I want your food! I want your water! I want your cover! But I want you off my back! But what happens? Eventually, with persistence, the horse yields to the cowboy. Now, when that horse yields, he hasn't lost his strength. He hasn't lost his power. He hasn't lost his identity as a horse. He has simply now come under the authority of that cowboy. And he now fits into the plan that that cowboy had for him. And he gets all the blessing beside. And it goes a whole lot easier. But see, there's a lot of us that are kind of like a wild horse. God, get off my back! Give me all your blessing, God. Give me the food, give me the water, give me the covering, but get off my back, God! Huh? And God's saying, no, 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 you don't understand. I am your God. I have a plan for you. I have a way that's best for you. And I want to get you to a point where you yield because I've got some blessing that's incredible for you, but you're not ready yet until you willingly submit to my plan. <laughs> Joshua and Israel come to my mind when I think of this. In Joshua chapter 6, maybe you're familiar with the story. The children of Israel had come out of Egypt 40 years before. Their leader that brought them out was Moses. He had died Joshua was now the new leader. He was actually getting to take them into the promised land. And their first battle was against this powerhouse city called Jericho. Had this massive wall around it that was so big you could drive chariots on top of the wall. And they were impenetrable. And so Joshua's up against this deal. He's a brand new leader. God shows up and he talks to Joshua in Joshua chapter 6. Listen. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. In other words, they saw Israel coming. They closed everything up, closed the gates, closed the wall. No one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hands. Now, now think about when God tells him this. This massive city with these huge walls now closes all the gates, locks everything up. All their, their warriors are around the top of the wall. And God says, Joshua, see, I'm giving you that city. And if you're Joshua, you're going, God, <laughs> they just closed shop. How are we supposed to get in there? And God continues. You shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do this for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. Joshua, see that city over there, that massive wall, all those warriors, that's yours. And I want you to know how God said it. I have given Jericho into your hands. That's my plan for you, Joshua. I want you to submit to my plan. Now, Joshua, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take all your warriors, and I want you to go out there, and I want you to circle around the whole city once. And I want you to do that every day for six days. Just get everybody together, get all your war gear on, and just go and march around the city. It's another one of those big screen in the sky things that I want to see. Because I want to see these guys in Jericho. Okay, get ready. Here they come. Here they come. And they come and they're all garbed out. They're saying nothing. They're not supposed to say anything. They're just supposed to march. And they march and they come up to the wall. And instead of going after the gate, they go around. And they go, what are they doing? What are they doing? They're circling. Get ready. They're circling. They're circling around. They're going to hit us from behind. You guys get ready back there. And they wait. And they just keep going around. What are they doing now? I think they're leaving. What? Yeah, they're leaving. And there they go. And they march out. What do you think that was all about? I don't know. I don't know. Next day, they're coming back! 
And the whole deal goes on again. You got to know by the fourth day, they're all sitting around snacking, going, hey, here comes those idiot Israelites again. They're going around again. Hey, stupid! What are you doing? They're probably throwing sandwiches at them and all kinds of stuff. And then God says, on the last day, the seventh day, I want you to march around seven times. So here they are. Here they come again. They go around once. What are they doing now? Are they leaving yet? No, they're going around again. What? Well, at least it's something different. We get to watch them again. Third time. Whoa, here they go again. Fourth time. By this time, the guys on the wall are getting kind of dizzy watching these guys go around. The seventh time, they shout to the top of their voices, yeah! And all of a sudden, the guys on the wall are going, whoa, what's going on? And there's a shaking around them. <laughs> this massive wall drops. And it was God. It was God. Now, if Joshua could have said, God, Six times, six days. Good Lord, you're an amazing God. We saw what you did to the Egyptians, Lord, with the Red Sea deal. Why do we got to go around six days and then seven times on the seventh? Lord, come on. Can you just like say, fall down or something? Why do we have to do this? But, but Joshua... He submitted willingly to God's plan and he got to reap an amazing blessing. And all the people that followed him got to do the same thing. Why? Because they were willing to submit. Listen, would you put this down? Submit to God's plan even when it doesn't make sense. Because sometimes it ain't going to make sense. I'm just here to tell you. I've walked with the Lord long enough to know that there are times he's going to ask you to do stuff and you're going to scratch your head and go, okay, you want me to talk to them, but they don't even like me. <laughs> All right, Lord. Uh, okay, I'll go. And then God does something amazing in that situation. Okay, Lord, I don't have a whole lot to give right now, but I'm really sensing that you're telling me I need to give. You know I got these bills coming up, Lord. Okay, it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to do it. You set yourself up for blessing when you willingly submit to God's plan with, without knowing it's going to make sense because on the surface it may seem a little crazy. Man, we could park there for a while, but I, I want to get to this third point. Blessing comes, number three, when you sincerely obey God's precepts. You say, oh, what's a precept? It's another way of saying commandments, but... Commandment starts with a C and I needed a P, so it's precepts. <laughs> Psalm 112.1 says this, Praise the Lord. How blessed is the person who fears the Lord. Remember, fearing the Lord means what? Taking God seriously. Who greatly, listen, delights in his commandments. Now, I want to share something with you here. This is so important. It doesn't just say, does God's commandments, does God's precepts. But look what it says. Delights in God's commandments. That's not just about action. Greatly de delights in his commandments. That's an attitude of willingness. This person is doing it and they're doing it willingly. Okay, God, I'll do it. There's a, there's a sincere obedience there. It reminds me of the story of the little guy. He was standing up and his mother wanted him to sit down. And his mother said, son, you need to sit down. And he just stood there with a defiant look on his face and would not sit down. She said, son, I told you, you need to sit down. And he just stood right there, just looking right at her, not just all stiff and straight. And she says to him, son... If you don't sit down, I will not take you to your friend's birthday party this afternoon. So he sits down and off. And he looks at his mom and he says, I am sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. <laughs> but that perfectly describes where some of us are in our walk with the Lord, doesn't it? God, I'm going to do it, but I'm not happy about it. Some of you have been sitting in these classes on Sunday night. 
All right, God says, love my wife like Christ loved the church. I'm going to love her, and I'm not happy about it. <laughs> listen, listen. It's about our heart, where our heart is. Obedience, the best type of obedience is obedience that's motivated by love. God, I'm going to obey you because I love you. I sure don't understand this. It doesn't make sense. I don't have any guarantee that the outcome is going to be what I want. But I'm going to obey you because I sure love you because you've done so much for me. That's, that's the sincere obedience. You want to be blessed? You want to open yourself up to God's blessing? Man, sincerely obey his commands. You say, well, I'm not really sure what he wants me to do. Well, why don't you start off with what he's already made clear? And don't worry about the unclear stuff. There's plenty of things here to line up with him on. Before you're all worried about who you're going to marry, what, what, what job you're going to pursue, what house you're going to buy. All that stuff's important. But until we line up here in his word, in his commands, his precepts, then all that other stuff really doesn't matter. In Luke chapter 5, there's a story. It's of Peter. He's a fisherman. And Jesus finishes speaking, and in verse 4, he says to Simon, or Peter, Hey, put out into the deep water and let down your net for a catch. Hey, Peter, go back out there, drop your net down in that deep water, and you'll, you'll catch some fish. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night, and we caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. Now, Peter's going... Jesus, maybe you don't understand the way this fishing thing works. If you don't catch something all night, there's a pretty good chance you ain't going to catch it. We've already put the nets away. We've already closed shop, Jesus. But you know what, Jesus? Okay. I, I, nevertheless, I'm going to do what you asked me to do. Verse 6. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. See, if... if Peter had decided not to willingly obey the precept, the command of Jesus, he would have missed out on a tremendous blessing. You, you want blessing in your life. Bottom line is, come to a point where you humbly rely on God's person. Come to a point where you willingly submit to God's plan. Come to a place where you sincerely Obey God's precepts. Hey, if it doesn't make sense, if it's not convenient, by the way, that's the last one there, even when it's not convenient, when it, when it doesn't give you any guarantee of an outcome, you know what, God? I want to be a place of blessing. And so, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust your person. I, I'm going to submit to your plan. I'm going to obey your precepts. Now, you say, okay, Rand, that was great, but the I am's, I, I got to finish the I am's. Why haven't we finished the I am's? Well, here's why. There's a couple here that wants God to have all of them. They want God's blessing on their lives and their relationship. Many of you know Rick and Julie. And they came to me and they said, we want to do it right. We want to get married. Amen. So Rick and Julie, would you come down here right now, please? <laughs> Lyndon and Tanya are standing with them. Lyndon, you just stand over here, Tanya, and you can stand right here. You guys stand right in front of me, huh? Can yes. you stand right in front of me? Because I... I'm going to stand up here. <laughs> this is why we switched gears this morning. Because they want God's blessing. 
They want God's blessing on what's happening in their lives. We've had a chance to meet together on a number of occasions. Julie, um, not long ago, placed her faith and trust in Christ. She was baptized back in August. Uh, Rick trusted Christ uh, a number of years ago. And uh, the Lord brought them together through various circumstances. Um, we, we were rehearsing this the other day. And just God's hand and even bringing the three of us together and just what God has done over the last few months has just been really cool. But you know you two, we, we talked and one of the things that we talked about is what this was all about. And, and, and whenever I think of marriage, I think of three words that come to mind and we talked about this. The word obedience, the word commitment, and the word love. You, you guys have come together and you've said, you know what? This is what God's plan is, and we want to willingly obey it. And it might not be convenient, and we certainly don't have the long-term outcome picture, right? But you've said, you know what, this is what God wants. This is what we believe we need to do. In fact, Rick was sharing with me just the other day, just talking to somebody in the family, and they said, why now? And he said, because it's the right thing to do. Amen. So amen. That's obedience. Commitment. Commitment is something we don't hear a lot today in our society because commitment involves promise. It involves giving to each other. And a lot of people don't want to make commitments because yeah, that's, that's hard. But you two have said, no, we're going to make this commitment. We're going to make this promise to each other. We're going to make it before our God and we're going to make it before our church family. And by the way, that was their idea to get married on a Sunday morning. It wasn't my idea. They wanted you a part of this. Yeah. Obedience, yeah, yeah. And you're also saying through this process that you love each other, right? And we talked about that the other day, that, hey, why don't we put that on the front? Why don't we go love, obedience, commitment? Well, love is really kind of the last deal because if you're obeying God and you're committed to each other, the love's going to grow. It's going to be there. Amen. And that's where you guys are at, and I thank God for that. Um, you're demonstrating your love to each other by giving yourself to each other. It's a very selfless thing. That's what the, the love action is all about. And, and the Bible says of this about God. In Romans 5 8, God demonstrated or showed his own love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The beauty of that, that verse is, you guys, is that God loved us when we were incredibly unlovely. Rick, you got a beautiful bride. Thank you. God loved you. God loved you, Julie, when you were unlovely, right? When we were sinners. That's the beauty of God's love for us. And it's a demonstration. It's a picture. We couldn't get to God, so God came to us. He extended that grace to us. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Love is about an action. It's not just a feeling. There are going to be times, and we've talked about this, that you're going to wake up and look at each other and go, I don't feel like I love him anymore. Because <laughs> it happens. And if you're basing your relationship on feeling, it's going to be like this. But you base your relationship on a promise. The love feelings will follow, and the love actions need to be consistent, right? So, that brings us to some vows. Vow is just a fancy word for promise. Would you guys face each other, please? You can hold her hand, it's okay. <laughs> she, she wants me to. <laughs> Rick, I'm going to start off with you, and you just repeat after me. Julie, I receive you. Julie, I receive you as a gift from God. As a gift from God. To be my wife. To be my wife. I gotta see you. Get a lot of pictures. 
I promise that I will love you and cherish you. I promise that I will love you and cherish you. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. For richer or for poorer. For richer or for poorer. And will be faithful to you alone. And will be faithful to you alone. As long as we both live. As long as we both live. Very good. Julie, if you'll repeat after me. Rick, I receive you. Rick, I receive you. As a gift from God. As a gift from God. To be my husband. To be my husband. I promise that I will love you and cherish you. I promise that I will love and cherish you. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. For richer or for poorer. For richer or for poorer. And will be faithful to you alone. And will be faithful to you alone. As long as we both live. As long as we both live. Church family, would you stand up? I would like you, after I read this statement, I would like you to either agree or keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Will you, Rick and Julie's family and church family, promise to do all that you can to support encourage and stand by Rick and Julie. Yes. Yes. That's what I wanted to hear. You may sit down. <laughs> Lyndon, you have a ring for me, sir? You forgot it? <laughs> <laughs> what are friends for? Actually, I need, yeah, I need that one. Yeah, good. This is a symbol. Uh, it's, it's not just a piece of jewelry. It symbolizes many things. Number one, it symbolizes what we talked about, this obedience, commitment, and love. When you wear a ring on your finger, a wedding ring on your finger, it's to remind you of this moment, of this time. And, and frankly, there'll be times that you may need to look at that hand <laughs> more than others, right? It, it's also a symbol to everybody else out there when they check your hand out. Oh, he's taken. <laughs> yep, that's right. You're taken. You're taken. You are now his. She is now yours. This symbolizes that. You are each other's. Amen? Yeah. It's obedience to God that you're saying, hey, we want to we do this before him and do it right. That's what this ring stands for. So, Rick, I'm going to give you this band. And as you place it on your lovely bride's finger, would you please repeat after me? Julie, with this ring. Julie, with this ring. In front of these witnesses and before God. In front of these witnesses and before God. I seal my promise. I seal my promise. To be your faithful and loving husband. To be your faithful and loving husband. There we go. <laughs> Julie, as you place this ring on, on Rick's finger, would you please repeat after me? Rick, with this ring. Rick, with this ring. In front of these witnesses and before God. In front of these witnesses and before God. I seal my promise. I seal my promise. To be your faithful and loving wife. To be your faithful and loving wife. And it fits. <laughs> well, you guys, you've taken your vows. You've committed yourselves to each other. We all saw it. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in accordance with the laws of this state, I pronounce you husband and wife.